It is my privilege now to facilitate this segment where we will be discussing inspiring and nurturing African graduates to lead the fourth industrial revolution and the entrepreneurial legacy. We'll also touch on accelerating social innovation and skills development in the economic and transformation sector. My panelists, my esteemed panelists, if I may call you uh, to join me here on the stage, I'll start with Ms. Ceci Nombulelo, who is the CEO of ETDP, CETA, and that stands for Education, Training and Development Practices Sector Education and Training Authority. I think since the advent of democracy in 1994, somehow we stopped speaking in full sentences and syllables. Ne? Everything became abbreviated, you know? Now we know it's, it's a ACDP, EDTP, but you know, Education, Training and Development Practices, Sector Education and Training Authority. Please may you join us on stage. May you please give a round of applause. Simamgele ngeza anjiz futu mele, siyamonga Dr. Wongiwe Ludidi is Managing Director, IGNAU Consulting Advisory Board Member at SACRA. And she'll be talking on 4IR as an accelerator for social innovation. And uh, please give a, a warm round of applause. And the only thorn among the roses, uh, Tamsangna, Mr. Tamsangna Makubela, Executive Chairman of SACRA. And SACRA stands for the South African Council of Graduates South Africa. Please may you join us on stage. Don't be selective in who you give a round of applause to. Let's not be economical with love. L love is a commodity that you should be giving out very freely. All right, so stay with us and please prepare your questions as well. Um, as we try and break down this big, momentous task that we have, especially in inspiring the youth and pursuing opportunities in education and through hard work, while we have the perennial problems of having to deal with social injustices, social inequality, and trying to also deal with the legacy of the past. So I'll just start to my extreme left. Dr. Luditi, if you'll just introduce yourself, what do you do? We heard briefly about the work or what inspires you, but just give us a sense of the organizational structure and what your obligations are. So I run a small boutique consultancy. It's called Igno Consulting. Um, and my core belief is that I've been ignited, I've been purposed to ignite greatness in others. So I focus on academic mentoring and coaching, specifically for doctoral students. I walk the journey with them until they, they finish. Um, I also be, belong to a program called Life After Metric, which is based in, in the VAL, which is basically an attempt for us to equip young people to navigate life post metric. I also sit on the advisory board of um, SACRA, which is really a body that is tasked with advancing young graduates and also cultivating the spirit of entrepreneurship. Um, in my consultancy, I'm the only person there, uh, which makes it easy for, for me. But, but really, I've got a deep passion for working with young people, igniting greatness in them, and just connecting them to opportunities. Because I've seen the magic that happens when you take one young person and give them what would be to them something that changes their lives forever. Yes, it's as we rise, you, you lift others as well. And I really appreciate that you're saying you are a micro-business, albeit that you're you are interested or you've got um, other interests as an advisory board member of uh, SACRA, but in your consultancy, you are one-man band, essentially. Yes. So when you have a team meeting or board meeting, it's all happening up here. It's with myself. And do you agree a lot with yourself? Or you, you know, stop, start. Do you, you, I can just imagine. We need to have that on record. But uh, let's invite now oh, Mr. Tamsanga Makobela, who's the executive chair of SACRA, uh, to introduce himself before I give you a story anecdotally of how I know him and how the, these hidden gems of excellence in society that often go unnoticed until, I guess, when the student is ready, the teacher then appears. Mr. Makobela. Thank you very much, Cindy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And good afternoon to everyone watching us all over the world. The South African Council for Graduates exists to 
give purpose to young people. You can have all the degrees you need. You can have the job you want. If you don't have a purpose, you are not serving any good. So we equip them with a sense of purpose, but much more than that, we go to the CETAs, we go to ETDP CETA, and all other CETAs, we get the money. You know, for the first time in this conference, I'm the first person to speak about money. People are scared of speaking about money, and it's what makes things happen. So we go to the CETAs, we get the money, but also we have to account for it, because then we enable these young people to be able to get a monthly stipend. Cindy has been a host employer. She knows how it works. And therefore, what is important for us is that they should not be trapped in the rat race of employment. We get them to move to entrepreneurship because we strongly believe that entrepreneurship is what has made countries like your Japan, the US, China, to be where they are and what they are today. So entrepreneurship, is a catalyst and actually with virtual realities we're going to make it even much more because we can reach many people wherever they are and of course there's a challenge because someone who is in Madela Gufa in Tembisa no matter how much they want to be part of this conference virtually the network there is very poor someone who is in Sishiko who wants to connect with us here today until we release the spectrum things would not improve. But I'll leave it at that for now for introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to clarify so we get things out of the way. They say clarity begets harmony so that there isn't this hovering uh, thought that, you know, as to how this relationship uh, started and how it uh, manifested between myself and the South African Council of Graduates. So I was a director of uh, one or other company and we needed additional hands and, and people just to do admin and this is where I found out, in fact, that you can get a graduate that you don't have to pay for because you're a small business or you're a micro business. And that person that you'll be employing has got this, the requisite skill sets, except they just need the experience. The beauty of it is that you don't have to pay for it as an entrepreneur. What you do is you go to Tamsanga or Isakra, and then they will do the necessary paperwork, and you get your, your skilled employee or your graduate, and that's uh, how supportive that relationship had been. I didn't even know this until about five years ago. So, But I just didn't want you to think that there were other kinds of relationship, <laughs> you know, a Zondo commission of sorts, who went to whose birthday party, no, just for clarity. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, and our next guest, uh, esteemed guest, is Ms. Ceci Nombulelo Ngaisi, who is the CEO of the Education, Training and Development Practices Sector Education and Training Authority. We know that there are a number of them in various sectors that primarily had to deal with the skills gap uh, in ensuring that those that were marginalized or excluded were able to be absorbed in the economy. But if you were to just explain your role um, and, and what benefit it brings to the economy. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Let me greet everyone uh, this afternoon. As indicated, my name is Sinom Bulelo Nasi. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the ETDP CETA. I know it's difficult, but uh, that is the most uh, uh, beautiful and important name there. ETDP CETA is one of the 21 CETAs that were established in 2000 through Skills Development Act. The reason why Skills Development Act was established there and was promulgated after the takeover of uh, the new democracy, this country realized that uh, there is a need to skill and reskill the people of South Africa, not only in order to lead for a democratic government, but also to be able to improve their social being and also their economic kind of sustainability. So those uh, CETAs were established and ETDP CETA has been operating since then. ETDP CETA is more broad compared to other CETAs and at times we refer as the mother of other CETAs because we deal with education, training and development practices. Anything that has to do with education, training and development practices that's where the ETDP CETA, I'll just quick, go quickly in terms of what we do. We do collect the revenue, uh, which is paid directly to the South African Revenue Services. 
in terms of the skills levy because there's a skills development levy act in the country. So all employers, they do that. We encourage and support employers to do skills planning. When they do skills planning, it means that they are in a position to plan for their workforce so that in this country we have a capable workforce. And therefore, as they plan, they look in terms of the developments. And now we are busy with making sure that all employers are training and developing their workforce in terms of the moving the times, in terms of the future skills for a changing world. That's briefly that. Secondly, we ensure that there are programs that are in place for development, for education and training. Uh, thirdly, we ensure that uh, there's quality because we facilitate quality of education and training. Hence, we look into the providers and ensuring that the providers that are providing training and development, they are providing such in a good quality and more with the time. And where I can also say briefly, our role is to ensure that we skill the nation. Skilling the nation is not training, is not educating only. But it takes the mind, it takes the body, it takes the soul, it takes everything, the holistic approach towards scaling. So that at the end of the day, as the ETTP CETA, we deal with two pillars that are brought. One, crushing and dealing with the issues of inequalities in our country. That is our main pillar because we talk about a triple challenge of uh, inequality, poverty, and unemployment. But I was dealing with the inequality. You will know that in this world, in the world of work, you are all categorized as highly skilled, semi-skilled, unskilled, uh, not knowing anything. And then your salary is based on that, your income is based on that, your wealth is based on that, and hence skilling is very important. And skilling is not training, as I've indicated. The second pillar that we deal with uh, is employability, which includes self-employment at the end of the day. Employability in terms of uh, providing those kinds of the skills that are required in the workplaces and the changing workplace from the entry level up to the, any kind of the level, uh, which includes only, not only the unemployed people, but employed people for occupational mobility. Just one example, the gentleman that is taking photos here came to the ETTP Center as an intern. This is a graphic designer. This is a photographer. This is a marketer. It's everything and has grown in terms of that. Those are the things that uh, we do at the ETTP Center. And uh, broadly, People look at the sitters and say that, no, I need money, and therefore ours is to ensure that we skill the nation. And our function is not training as such. Ours is to promote skills development, is to facilitate skills development, is to ensure that skills are in place and skills, they move with time. You don't skill what is there because the skill is always uh, going to be redundant at some point. Yes, if, if I may, and I don't mean to, to break your word, yes. but I just want us to deal with things in a bite-sized fashion okay. um, and explore particularly skills for the future, as you alluded to, uh, future skills for 2030, whatever milestone we've set yep. ourselves, is the current climate is very much hostile, if you like, to employment. We know that the uh, job unemployment rate is sitting at 29.5%, depending on your source of data. So how then are these kind of uh, authorities or seaters relevant going forward in the climate of a slow economy or sluggish economy that's never really been about job absorption or creation? What is going to be different now in this, um, in this atmosphere? What is different now is the kind of the skills that need to be acquired by the unemployed people, the skills and the values that will shape their lives in future. In fact, we have moved that to say that let us look at the subjects and everything. We are saying currently, uh, let us look in terms of uh, what type of uh, a young, pe young person that must be developed so that you don't say, I'm going to teach you physical science, I'm going to teach you chemistry. Let us teach you the skill. Our learners, our unemployed people must have the skill of curiosity, a skill of imagination, a skill of resilience, 
a skill of respecting the ideas, the perspectives of the world, and a skill to cope with failure and rejection, and the skill to face adversity. Once you have done that, then you develop a program that will lead to those acquisition of the skills. And then we're looking at the entrepreneurs of this country who will become the industrialists at the end of the day because we want them to own the industries, to manage those, and not be the beggars all the time and be wages kind of receiving. And see, you know, we often hear about youth apathy, and I think it's, um, it's justified where young people and many of us have the aspirations that come 1994, you're going to move into number one, Grayson Street or Houghton, uh, for, for somebody who had been excluded from living in suburbia. Uh, be it that it was unrealistic that you're obviously going to take over from the formal economy. Are we still in a place where we essentially just promoting hope? To say that education is the only opportunity that you'll have to transform your life, and not necessarily giving the flip side of it to say there may not be a job for you out there. So we need to be self-reliant. Uh, Dr. Molapo was talking about how we are almost indoctrinated. You go to school, you graduate, find a job, work for so many years and get your pension at the end of the year, which is obviously not a adequate. Are we, are we not putting enough emphasis on developing young people to a point that they're self-sustained from be a tertiary level as opposed to us being so fixated with find a job, you know, preparing them yes. for employment. And I'll give that question mm. if you don't mind. I just want to include uh, okay. Dr. Ludidi just on okay. that and yes. we'll get a response from Mr. Emma Kubela as well. One of the things we need to do is to understand the education that we're giving to our young people. We're giving them an education that allows them to be literate but doesn't necessarily impart on them the skills that they need to be able to function in this current environment. One of the things that I'm grateful for about COVID is that it's accelerated what we've always known all along, that we are not skilling our young people correctly. We are not equipping them to be able to function in a future world that is run by technology, by the Internet of Things, by artificial intelligence, and by smart factories. We know that. So, when, when we then answer the question that you've posed, we need to start at the very basic. How do we then teach someone at an early childhood center the skills that they will, that they will need? How do we revamp our curricula throughout so that it is not rigid? You know, when you go to university tomorrow and you want to register for a become degree in accounting, already the courses you must do have been laid out for you. And they're so rigid. They don't provide a young person with the skill of cognitive flexibility, of being able to move within different sectors or industries, if I may call it that. So it's time that we look at how we then put together the skill sets that we want our young people to have. And we start to take them apart to say, when we look ahead in 2030, the type of young person who will be able to be functional is someone who has cognitive flexibility in that they're able to cope with the challenges that arise. They're able to make mental models in their minds to be able to respond to opportunities and to challenges that come. We must also insist on building young people that have digital literacy. You know, and digital literacy means at a very young age, let's not be afraid to teach our young people that it's fine to take things apart. It's okay for you to be curious about how something works because it is in that curiosity that people are able to come up with solutions. So we must be able to cultivate that type of thinking. But skills that are becoming important as well for, for the future, it's skills like judgment and, and decision making. Our education system teaches our young people to regurgitate. You know, one plus one is two, it ends there. Beyond that, how then do we say to you, one plus one is two, but how do you make sense of the analytics that will come? We speak of robotics, we speak of artificial intelligence, but we must never forget the fact that it is human beings who will still need to deal with the subjective data sets and the subjective analytics, therefore. And that is the skill that we must cultivate in our young people. Mamma spoke about young people that are going to be resilient, who are going to be respective. More and more, we are seeing this global shift towards very diverse um, workplaces, very diverse communities, very diverse social systems. 
how do we cultivate in our young people the ability to be able to perform in those given environments where it's not only going to be people who look like you, who sound like you, who are in your environment, respect for other cultures. Those are things that we need to teach our young people. When we're speaking about the global mobility of skill, how do we make sure that a young person who is in South Africa today is able to perform at their best in London, in Singapore, in Australia, keeping in mind that in those areas there is nothing that will facilitate your entry into whatever economic activity you want to be part of. So we must equip you as a young person to be able to have that global mobility. And lastly, we must teach our young people that there is no box. Let's do away with the notion of thinking out of the box. For me, the box must not exist at all. You know, I'm a big proponent of saying that we must stop saying to our children, do not touch that, because then we teach them to be afraid of trying out new things. Let's let them run wild. Let's let them explore, because then they get to think in a way that is free and in a way that makes them global citizens. That's my take. Thank, thank you for that. Just to recap, Tam Samuel, so what the, the question was really about is to how do we manage the legitimate expectation, especially if we're perpetuating education as a key to this world of opportunities, and we know the reality is not necessarily the case. How do we manage that and prepare young people uh, to be self-reliant? Thank you for the very good question. What we are lacking, which we need to build in, not just in the curriculum, but at home. First is the ability to have the confidence for inquiry. Dr. Lutiti just spoke about stopping the habit of saying no to a child. But how do you not say no when you live in a squatter camp? There's only one iron, and it's not also working properly. Should a young Langa, a young guy, so tries to explore in playing with an iron or an electric kettle and it breaks down, the whole household has been put in a system or a situation where they cannot have another one. So innovation stops at home. Secondly, areas where we need to develop more is the ability and appreciation for money, money skills. Parents, most of you here are parents. I'm begging you, let us help our young people to have a relationship with money at an early age. So many people are so scared of money. So many people don't even know their worth. So let us help our young people, not only by teaching them. At Sagra, we have come up with what we call a ladder for career growth. A ladder for career growth includes teaching, which only includes 10%. Then it moves to training. Training is important, but it's still a top-down approach. Then we move to incubation. Incubation is very important and very necessary for young people because it is at an incubation level where they begin to have an intersection and a relationship with the products, with the services, and with the market. So if we enable them to have that relationship with incubative, at an incubative level, they would begin not only to have a value chain respect for where they are going or where they are. The next part of this uh, career ladder is what we call mentoring. Mentoring young people, it's then beginning to say, you may be a peer. There's peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. There is mentoring by a person who is very much senior in, or an expert or a competent person at something that they're doing. So mentoring will then further escalate the learning process for young people. Then we have an aspect of coaching. When people are coached, I learned this uh, myself when I was at, uh, a student at Charles State University in Australia in the early 90s. Outside of a lecture room, you would then go to meet your coach. So we'll be grouped into groups of five, and we'll have a coach, be it a business person, be it a clinical psychologist,
who will take you through to where you are and what are your aspirations and show you. I think one of the speakers spoke earlier today about showing you the blind spots. If our education system only focuses on teaching and learning, we're going to lose young people. So at the end, and to finalize responding to your question, we need to move away from the memory type of education. We need to evolve towards validation and thinking. Thinking will help young people to become innovative, and that is where they will bring in inventiveness in themselves. So the level of education that we have, it's still really making sure that our young people become the second best. They will never be the best in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I want to put this to you, and we'll take questions on the floor. If anybody wants to interject, it is interactive. Uh, and you just indicate to yourself, I see you, Aileen, and then we'll just ask for a microphone, please. Aileen, is in the, she's that love, the beautiful lady from Ituba. Yes, Ituba home. Uh, she'll, she'll pose a question, and we have Mr. Naidu there as well. So while we, we're getting the mics to you, I just want to put to the panel to ponder on this question. Yes, the focus, and, and, and uh, um, rightfully so, should be on young people, but we also have some form of success and some, some stumble block or bottleneck in the, in the informal economy where you'd find there was at some point a Guatema exhaust center, this, which was run by Mr. Pinky Mabi, but then he wasn't able to transfer the skills or he didn't have sons as heirs to take the business forward. So the intergenerational ability of sustaining businesses uh, in the informal economy, primarily in townships, rural areas, and our knowledge-based systems that we may have neglected um, in ensuring that we're able to sustain ourselves. We'll go to Aileen while you ponder that question. Hi, Please good. reintroduce yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Eileen Smith from Ituba Place of Hope. I have a question and a statement. Sorry, going back to not saying no, um, it's important that we stop saying no because it allows us to give our children accountability. If you say to a child and give them an option and say, do not touch the iron. If you touch the iron, what will happen? I will get burnt. If you get burnt, what else will happen? And, and, and it's just my observation when it comes to saying no. I feel that we don't give our children enough, let's say, acknowledgement. We don't give them enough to actually say that they can make the right choices if we allow them the opportunity to do so. Another question is, as someone who trains women in communities, so as a life coach, I decided that um, healing should not be a privilege. I started training women in Aldo's, in Dipslut. I looked at CETA, and the prices are very high. So how does an organization like ours, or many others, let's say I am certified, I know that I can do it, I've been training women, and I mean, through another institution, and I wanted to actually do it for free because I believe that the lady sitting in Dipslut should have one woman she can go to for help. And, and, and. How is it more accessible? How, what, what structures do you have in place for people that are interested in actually helping communities more in terms of training and facilitating? Thank you. Thank you. So how, how, how is training more accessible, especially for info, uh, peri-urban and township uh, areas. And Derek, I think you had your, your hand next, eh? Mr. Naidu? Yeah. Daniel. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Daniel Naidu, Digital Transformation Africa. Uh, my question is to Madam CEO for ETDP CETA. Uh, Ma'am, um, what framework uh, does the ETDP CETA have uh, for um, digital transformation so far as training programs are concerned? Is there a framework in place for curriculums to be submitted to you guys for approval? And in part two of my question uh, is, uh, what bridges does the CETA have with private sector, uh, for example, mentorships um, in place to help students make that transition from learning to working? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Isaac Boshomani, the owner and founder of Habocas. We train motor mechanic artisans and that in Soshangube Township. That's far 71 are qualified. 
16 of whom are young ladies. The question is to, to the CEO. Uh, we, we, we are grateful for the grants that were given to train the young ones. Uh, however, the grants were uh, made out from the higher level uh, considering the big companies. I think, I don't know whether they, they thought the, the, the township and rural area will never get into the space. The question is, uh, can we increase the 165,000 per learner for three years in the trade to a higher level or just amend the policy when it comes to township or rural area, especially because we want to increase the entrepreneurs and also for the young people not to go out and look for work, especially where they can work, where they stay, instead of coming to the big cities. Thank you. Thank you. And then the last question for now we'll take from Mr. Laki Mondlani, who is from Intrinsic Zumba Group. Thank you very much. I'm Laki Mondlani from IDG Intrinsic Group. I'd like to know from the CEO of HDP and the other cities, what is the plan for the new normal in terms of the technology and in terms of training the new upcoming students? Thank you very much. So we'll start with you, Madam CEO. I think it was about the access to um, learnership and training and bridging from Mr. Naidu there, the, the gap between the uh, corporate sector and um, the CETA. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there's uh, quite, I think, four of them. Uh, they, have, uh, they need a response from ATTP. So thank you very much for your questions. I will just uh, be brief, but uh, I will leave my details so that uh, anyone that would wish to interact with me, I can advise and making sure that uh, at the end of the day, you, you are satisfied. We have not come here just as a talk shop, but to make sure that uh, we, we address the things, uh, especially from the CETA, which is a public entity that must deliver and support the people. In terms of supporting smaller organizations, all the CETAs are having uh, a grant that is allocated for NGOs, NPOs, and CPOs. Uh, what you do, you need to make sure that you provide your details. I must say that um, what needs to be understood is that the sitters are operating using the funds of the levy payers. So that fund must go back to the levy payers. Uh, and other people complain that sitters do not give the money. The money is not given to the individuals, but the money is given so that those that are vulnerable in terms of the training and required training must be trained and there must be quality training. And uh, when you do that as an NGO, NPO, you must uh, do the program of the CTAG, which is called assessor training, moderator training, and facilitation training. Because everybody thinks that they can train. That's not the issue. It cannot work like that. Uh, just to your question, we talked about education. Education is important, but education doesn't mean that you just take your books, go to schools, you are taught, you think you have learned. We're talking about skills and skills revolution. And therefore, you need to have such skills of putting across that instruction, that learning to the learners, so that you don't say, I teach, they regurgitate. You facilitate, and there's learning, and there's change in behavior at the end of the day. So there is moderation. A facilitation kinds of uh, short skills programs, then you become accredited by the CETA or go to any other CETA or the Quality Council for Trades and Occupations, QCTO. But we can talk more in terms of how you do and where you wish to work. That funding is available uh, when you make a proposal that makes sense to benefit those that are vulnerable at the end of the day. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, the, the bridges that are there, and also the training that needs to, to happen, uh, and the move to digital kind of the space. Yes, all sitters now, whether by choice or not, but they have been forced, and as the, my colleague said that COVID-19 had to accelerate the things. We talk about online training, we talk about blended learning. Uh, all sitters were forced to have digital 
transformation strategies in terms of that. Now, in, at ETT Presita, we have transformed and moved in terms of our quality assurance processes because we can no longer come to your center and assess pages and papers that are there. So there are online kind of processes. Business processes have been transformed. Yes, we are not yet there 100%, but a change has been made to move to, to digital kind of processes, and we are revamping our processes. What also is uh, happening, mentorship, uh, as has been indicated, it's very critical. And uh, we have a program at ETDP CETA which is called Work Integrated Learning, ensuring that uh, work is integrated with learning. It starts with our students that are active at colleges, ensuring that they are at best workplaces where they can learn and simulate uh, so that they don't need to have a number of years of experience before that. But what is critical for us, work integrated learning must happen at the curriculum design, must happen at the assessment. But that work integrated learning does not have to be manual. We are moving in terms of the fourth industry, in fact, fifth industrial revolution as we talk at this point in time. So there are those kind of uh, digital training. The Quality Council for Trades and Occupations has developed a framework for online programs. You just need to take your current program and put it into the framework. I can provide you the framework that they have provided and refer you where to go and then align your program and submit it to be re-looked into because assessment has to be different, but quality should not be compromised at that point. Uh, the other one is an issue around the artisans training. Uh, you talked about mock term mechanics. Um, I can refer also your question. I am the deputy chair of the CETA COs forum. We meet on a monthly basis. We have raised the issues of uh, inadequacy of that training because artisan development is quite expensive. These days we talk about not training for the sake, we talk about facilitation, online, digital, and the gadgets and the data that has become a digital divide at the end of the day. So we were looking into that. But also we're following a, a model that the government has put in place now, the district model approach. No more one size fits all. If I give this one 20,000, I think the person with disability is also 20,000. We look at a holistic approach in terms of where do you want to take this young person from? And two, what is the destination? And we don't want to train and tick a box now. It doesn't help. The economy is very low. It's a question of leading them towards a, a destination where we can sustain the livelihoods at the end of the day. So sustainability of the livelihoods is very important at the end of the day. And giving them that kind of independence for them to continue and be mentored around that. So hence, even with the kind of the artisans, if you work on the artisans to become cooperatives at the end of the day, Getting the funding from CIFA and CEDA, uh, the government has made those. Uh, SMMEs and also cooperatives are getting special funding from government. And the set asides are going to be in place for supply chain management processes uh, that are there. So there's quite a lot of developments that are there so that we need to provide the information that is important. So rural and townships, uh, if you look at the rural and uh, township, uh, development strategies that are in place. You can't treat them like urban, Gauteng, and other kind of areas because there are certain kinds of the needs. But what you want to avoid, don't take a township one and say when they look for a workplace, they must go to Gauteng. Let us build the economy in our townships. Let us build the economy in our rural areas so that uh, they also become urbanized in one way or another. Uh, the last one is the plan for the new normal. Yes, uh, the digital strategy is moving. We have moved uh, long strides around that. We are forced and pushed to ensuring that uh, we can't do things in the same way. I cannot take any submission. Uh, let's make sure that, uh, hence, we have virtual meetings. But how do we make sure that uh, these become qualitative and also sustainable at the end of the day? And they build the kind of the skills that we need for the better economy and social kind of uh, cohesion in, in our people. Th thank you so much, and I do hate to break your word. 
just for the record. But yeah, because we're on virtual platforms and we do have time constraints, I do apologize for having interrupted you. And may I please request to the two remaining guests, when you respond, to maybe take on Laki Mondlani's question around what the new normal is, because we have all these fantastic frameworks and policies that clearly haven't been as effective as we would want them to have been. And now that we find ourselves in the new normal, what is likely to change that we can take going forward as you wrap up? We'll start with you, Dr. Ludit. I suppose, Mr. Mandlane, the only thing I can say is the new normal is that there is no normal anymore. <laughs> And I'm not trying to be facetious in saying that, but we, we really need to take a step back. I think that we've been very quick to say we've got the new normal, but we're not even sure what that normalcy would, would look like in, in a few months to, to come. I think we are still trying to, to find our feet, and what is required from us is high levels of fluidity and to be able to respond to challenges as they come. I spoke about cognitive flexibility earlier to say how do we equip ourselves with the type of um, cognitive resilience that we would need to say as the world is changing and this carpet is shifting underneath us, how do we move with the shifting carpet but still making sure that we, we are surviving? Um, I think the new normal is still going to be defined. We are not there as yet. COVID has disrupted a lot of things and it's just put a spin in the works in terms of how the future is going to look like, the future of work, economic activity and everything else around that. So my personal take is that the new normal is still going to, to be defined. We are not there as yet. The only thing we need to do, let's be flexible cognitively, let's develop emotional and cognitive resilience to be able to weather the challenges and opportunities that are actually coming. Thank you very much. The new normal for South Africa really means we need to release the spectrum. Yep. But we cannot wait for government. Each and every nation, each and every society that would wait for the government would wait till cows come home. Actually, government should be coming after we have started the journey. We should be the one inviting government, not going to government to apply. We are the shareholders in this country. Governments, they are board members. Who hires, who fires the board members? It's us as the government. So the new normal, Mr. Mondlane talks to crowdfunding. There's so much money. There was such a jubilation when alcohol was meant to be released. How much money really goes into buying booze in South Africa? And how much of that money we can save and invest and buy some of the new equipment and infrastructure that we require, which are communal owned? The new normal for us really means that we see Africa as a village, not just see the borders of South Africa. Our market is in Africa as a continent and globally. So as an entrepreneur, if your market is your village or your town, you don't understand the new normal. You can be able to set up virtual offices almost in any other country. So we are saying to all of us that are sitting here today, our new normal is really to understand that global village requires new sets of doing business. And that will require high level of expertise high level of competence. You may have the skill, but if you're not competent, who's going to buy from you? So South Africa, we need to work together and we need to stop pointing fingers at other people. Let us be the example by doing what we need to do to make this country succeed. I thank you. Thank you so much. Please give them a round of applause. And thank you to you watching on Facebook and on our social media platforms and for the questions here at the venue. I, I really, really appreciate your input, inspiring and nurturing African graduates to lead the 4IR entrepreneurial legacy, Mr. Tamsang Mamad Kubela, Executive Chair at SACRA, Dr. Wongi Wong Ludidi, Managing Director of IGNAU Consulting and Advisory Board Member at SACRA, and Ms. Sesi Numbulelo Nwesi, CEO of ETDTC, Tasiabongagakulu. So this is, thank you so much. And I mean, you were talking about um, um, instant gratification or delaying gratification around alcohol. People have never been so nice in South Africa until so good no now so as thing I six is and and you're quite right that that this village if we we just 
prioritize certain things, you know, we are able to then effect change as we desire it.